All right, here we are, understanding your religion, seven major doctrines that define Christianity. This is lesson number three. The title of this lesson is The Doctrine of Inspiration, part two. And we're going to talk about the New Testament record this morning. Now in our Bible, in our study rather of the Bible as a reliable text, that's, what, that's kind of the theme for the last couple of lessons. We've covered several areas. First of all, we've talked about the history of writing itself. The idea that writing you know, in an ancient, is an ancient art and that contrary to certain skeptics' arguments in the past that the Bible you know, wouldn't have been written that long ago. People used to say, oh, they didn't have writing thousands of years ago. That, of course, skepticism has been swept aside by research that proves that you know, writing existed long before the first books of the Bible were ever recorded. We have uh, in Egypt's first dynasty, uh, 3,000 years before Christ, we have examples of, of writing. Uh, we looked at the history of books. Since the Bible is a book, we trace the history of you know, bookmaking from uh, stone to tablets, clay tablets, the use of animal skins, papyrus down to the printing press and today where many versions uh, are printed in most languages uh, and they're uh, available online for free. Imagine any Bible in any language you can get it for free. The access is, is free, biblegateway.com. Uh, and then we looked at the Old Testament, the writing, the compilation, the division of the Old Testament over a 1500 year period. How did that book get to us? We looked at the difference between the Jewish division of material and the modern division, same material, it's just divided differently, but we examined that also. And we also reviewed some ancient books written about uh, Jewish life at the time. I also said that we would um, look at a way to divide the Old Testament into 10 periods. And I've included that in your study notes uh, they're attached to the, uh, to the lesson notes. Very quickly, you can divide the Old Testament into just 10 periods. And if you're wondering you know, what, how is this broken down on, in your notes, there's the period of time, there's the time chronologically, and then there are the books of the Bible that write about or that are written about that time period. Okay? So for example, if you want to divide the Old Testament period into 10 periods, this is one way of doing it. The first period would be called the antediluvian, meaning before the flood. Antediluvian period, 5,000 years plus before Christ. In the Bible, which books talk about that period of time? Well, Genesis chapters one to eight talk about that time period. Second period, post-diluvian. In other words, after the flood, 3,000 years B.C., what books in the Bible refer to that period of time? Well, Genesis chapter 9 to 11. The patriarchy, the fathers, right? Abraham, Isaac, you know, those people, 2,000 years before Christ, which books of the Bible talk about those people? Well, Genesis chapters 12, all the way to chapters 50, and the book of Job. Uh, the period of bondage, you know, when the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt, about 1,600 years B.C., what book of the Bible talks about that? Well, Exodus chapters one to 12. Then the period of conquest, um, 1400 years BC, that's when Moses leads the people into the promised land. They begin to conquer the promised land, begin to settle it, the tribes, so on and so forth. Which books of the Bible talk about that period, 1400 years BC roughly? Well, Exodus 13 to 40, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel chapters 1 to 10. All those books talk about that particular period of time. Then the United Kingdom, when all the tribes were together under one king. Um, uh, Saul and, and then David and then Solomon. That's called the United Period, around 1000 BC. Again, which books talk about that period? 1 Samuel 11 to 31, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings 1 to 11, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. Those books talk about that period of history. 
Uh, the divided kingdom, after Solomon dies, there is a civil war, the kingdom is divided into two, the north and the south, uh, a period of time roughly around 800 BC. Again, which books talk about this period? Well, the latter half of 1 Kings, 12 to 22, 2 Kings, the latter portion of uh, 2 Chronicles, and then these prophets, Isaiah, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, and Zephaniah, all those prophets lived and, 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 and wrote about the, um, the uh, divided uh, period, uh, or the divided kingdom period. And then you have the period of exile, when the Jews were in Babylon, right? And uh, around 600 BC, where the southern kingdom was conquered, many people brought to uh, Babylon, about 600 BC, roughly in that period. Uh, the books of Daniel, Ezekiel, and Lamentations talk about that period. And then restoration, the ninth historical period, 500 BC, when the Jews start trickling back, coming back from uh, captivity, from Babylon, reestablishing the city of Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, that's what's called the period of restoration. 500 BC, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. Malachi, the very last of the prophets that talk about that period. And then you have the period, what we call the period of silence. No inspired writings during that time. The period between Malachi and John the Baptist, roughly four centuries there. There, was, uh, there were writings, but they were not inspired, and I talked about those last week, right? Uninspired writings, but that give us a lot of information about that time period. I've not listed all the books here, but you know, the book of Esdras, uh, the book of Judith, uh, the Maccabees, all those books, all those writings about that intertestamentary period between the testaments, okay? So I've given you that as a, something you can fold in your Bible, and uh, you know, when somebody's talking about a certain prophet or something like that, you can check, what's the, when did that prophet speak? What period of, of, uh, uh, of history uh, that they, uh, they lived in and that they spoke of. All right, so today we're going to move on to the New Testament record and how the New Testament was recorded. Now there are a lot of books that were written about the life of Jesus and several books were written by the apostles and their disciples. The question is how did they divide which books actually belonged in the New Testament. It's not as if there were only 27 books that were written about Jesus' life. There were hundreds of them written about Jesus at that time and written about the church. Which ones make it into the New Testament? How did they decide which books actually belonged there? So the books that make up the New Testament are called the canon. Not a canon that fires a cannonball, but the canon. A uh, Greek word which means a measuring rod, something that you measure with. So the books that measured up, so to speak, those are the ones that belong in the canon, the books that measure up. The word referred to uh, those things which measured up when examined. In other words, when the early church examined all the material that was written about Jesus, how did they decide which books belonged in the New Testament canon. Okay? So out of the hundreds of books and letters and so on and so forth, how did they narrow it down to 27? Well there were three main factors that led the early church to form the New Testament canon and preserve it in one book. Now in the beginning the church did not have a high regard for keeping the letters of the apostles and the disciples and there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the apostles were alive and they were producing a lot of letters, so there was no urgency in trying to preserve their, their letters. Secondly, there was a lot of written material being produced, so no one thought that they needed to keep some of the stuff. You know, I mean, you know, there's lots circulating, why should we keep any of it? And then thirdly, and I think most importantly, in the first century, the general consensus was that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. So the need for preserving the material for the future was not there. Their, their thought, you know, we read about this in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, those people in that church thought, well, the Lord's coming back. You know, I mean, some of them actually quit their jobs. 
stop producing, just kind of sitting back waiting for the Lord to come because you know, no use building a house, no use trying to get the business going, no use saving up any money. No, you know, why? The Lord's coming back. You know, we, why should we make the effort? And Paul kind of admonishes them you know, to work. That's in, it's in, in Thessalonians when, where he says, you know, if they won't work, they shouldn't eat. You know what I'm saying? Which is, I think, a good, uh, be a good government policy. But anyways, that's, uh, you know, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> Uh, but then certain events took place that required them to begin collecting and preserving the teachings of the Lord and the Apostles. First of all, something called the Canon of Marcion. The Canon, so we know what the, can, the word Canon means, right? So this fellow Marcion decided to organize his own Canon, his own you know, idea of which books should be. Uh, collected and kept somewhere in the area of uh, AD 140. So um, Marcion, we see him historically as a false teacher, he rejected the entire Old Testament and he accepted only 10 of the epistles of Paul and a part of Luke's gospel but rejected everything else. And he began circulating this group of letters, if you wish, as the official canon. And so the early church, in order to counter this movement, was forced to decide which of the writings were authoritative and begin to collect and circulate these. And this, this activity began somewhere uh, around 140 A.D. and it was done somewhere around 170 A.D. So they, they began to examine and collect what they believed were the uh, inspired writings because somebody else beat them to it. Okay? Secondly, uh, the persecution began. Under the Roman Emperor Diocletian, it was a capital offense to possess a copy, any copy, of the Christian scriptures. So this brought up the question, which scriptures were worth dying for? <laughs> if you're going to be killed for hanging on to a, you know, a letter of Paul or somebody, you know, uh, I, I want to make sure that if I'm going to give up my life for something, it's worth it. So they be, you know, this was another motivation to weed out you know, what was not official, authoritative, or inspired. And then thirdly, a kind of a technological advancement that we talked about last week called the codex, the codex form. Codex is the book form where several pages were placed together. Instead of using a scroll, they began using book forms. That was called the codexes, okay? So this, um, this form, as it became popular, brought up the question, well, which books should be grouped together into one volume? If we're going to switch over the technology, you know, let's, let's decide which papers, which, you know, which books are we going to put into a single volume as a codex, all righty? So this motivated them to keep only the books that were acceptable in this single volume. But the main question for the early church was, which are the inspired books? That's the big question. I mean, there was no meeting you know, where they reviewed all the material and then they made a decision as to which made it in and which didn't. They didn't have a list of books and go, okay, this one, not this one, I don't like this guy. You know, oh, this guy's my brother-in-law, yeah, he'll make it in. You know, the, it didn't work like that. On the contrary, the early church simply accepted those works that had already been recognized as inspired over the centuries, but had not yet been collected and organized into one volume. Okay? This was finally done in 367 A.D and the 27 books confirmed by the Council of Carthage later in that century has remained the same since without a single change. So the New Testament that we have now is exactly the same New Testament that they had beginning in 367 A.D. In other words, the way it's collected, the way it's organized, and so on and so forth. Before that, these letters were circulating independently. For example, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts were one volume and it, and it circulated, you know, because they were written by the same person, it circulated independently. Well, by 367 A.D., Luke-Acts became part of the New Testament uh, canon. Um, 
But in collecting the books for inclusion in the New Testament canon, the early church was guided by certain principles. So the first you know, criteria, as I mentioned, was authorship. If a man was inspired when he spoke, then his writings were also considered inspired. That was the line of thinking. In other words, if Peter, the apostle, when he spoke, when he preached, and so on and so forth, was considered an inspired apostle, then Peter's writings were also inspired. So for this reason, the writings of the apostles were quickly accepted into the canon. That was a kind of a, an easy one. Also, the men who were associated with the apostles were also accepted. Luke, uh, because of his association with Paul. Mark, because of his association with Peter. Mark was kind of like Peter's secretary, if you wish. If you read the, the Gospel of Mark, you know, Matthew, Mark, if you read the Gospel of Mark, well, Mark is really Peter you know, speaking. Right? It's really the story of Peter. Um, uh, James, for example, was called the brother of the Lord and an apostle in Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, and so his book, the book of James. Okay? This, of course, allowed the Gospels and the letters of Paul and Peter and James and John to be a natural selection into the canon, because these books, these letters, had been circulating for years, for decades, among the churches. All right? So it was like a no-brainer. They'd been circulating and accepted, and so they made their way into the canon very quickly. The uh, second criteria was the value of the book. In some cases, a book had a name attached to it, but it did not read like a New Testament book. There were a lot of uninspired authors who tried to gain an audience by putting the name of an apostle on their book. For an example, for example there was one book called The Acts of Peter. Well, Peter never wrote the Acts of Peter. We know who wrote Acts. It was Luke. So someone wrote a book and was not well known. And so in order to gain popularity and circulation, they put the name of an apostle as the author. So there was a lot of those, you know, a lot of that kind of material that was circulating. Now scholars uh, who study these uh, things tell us that it was fairly easy to distinguish between an inspired writing and fake or false writing when you actually read the material. Okay? When you actually read it, it was fairly simple to see that this was not an inspired writing. For example, there's one text called the Gospel of Thomas. Um, and in the Gospel of Thomas, the writer says that Jesus made sparrows out of mud and he was rebuked for doing so on the Sabbath, and he said, rise up and fly away. And the birds came to life and flew away. And you're going, yeah, it doesn't sound like what the apostles. You know, Jesus healed on the Sabbath, right? He healed on the Sabbath, uh, but uh, just to arbitrarily you know, create birds out of mud you know, to pick a fight, you know, it didn't seem like uh, New Testament uh, ideas. There's another story where uh, Jesus, as a young person, is working with his father who's a carpenter and there's a board you know, that doesn't fit and so Jesus miraculously stretches the board to you know, make it fit uh, the, the, the table that uh, they were building. Again, you know, mm, maybe not, you know, I, don't, I don't think so. So uh, in other words, when comparing the writings it was fairly easy to tell the real from the fakes. And of course a lot of the apostles were alive and were able to you know, say I didn't write that or this is not my, my work. Um, the inspired books had a harmony of thought and purpose and style. There were no contradictions and they were accurate historically, you know, as far as the life of Jesus is concerned and the life of the church is concerned, but they were accurate theologically as well. And that was very, very important. All right? And then a third criteria, you had the, you know, the, the author of the book, the value of the book, and also how it was circulated. The church did not decide which ones were suitable and which ones were not. They merely confirmed and collected those books which had traditionally been accepted by all the churches but had never been collected into one volume before. So again, it was very much after the fact. The books that the churches 
that had had inspired apostles work and plant them, those churches, those books that they had worked with for decades and decades, those were the books that were accepted. What was interesting is that no new books were introduced. Only those letters and volumes that had wide circulation and acceptance after long ages of study um, and review were accepted. Obviously, they weren't going to accept a book that was written in the third century. Why? Well, the apostles were dead by then. They were the inspired writers and the associates of the apostles. They were the inspired writers, okay? So um, the canon uh, of the New Testament was confirmed 300 years after the first writing began to be circulated. And of course, I didn't mention this, but we also believe that God was guiding and protecting the process in which His word was recorded and preserved. You know, I mean, that's not something that you can you know, check historically, but as Christians, you know, of course, God is guiding. You know. If we ask God, please help me, guide me in what I'm doing, switching my job, or you know, help me to deal with my child you know, and to discipline my child, you know, we ask Him for all kinds of things. Don't you think these early church fathers and leaders were saying, dear God, please help us you know, to make sure that we are getting the right letters and the right material into the canon. All right, so let's talk about the division of the New Testament. When it was finally completed, the 27 books were divided into the following groups. So you had the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four of those. Uh, history, the book of Acts. Uh, the Pauline epistles that we uh, refer to. Uh, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd uh, Timothy. Titus and Philemon, those are the epistles of Paul. The fourth category uh, are the, what's called the general epistles, Hebrew, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Jude, and then finally the fifth category is prophecy, and that is the book of Revelation for a total of 27, uh, 27 books. Most of these written by the apostles, or the disciples of the apostles. Now, there were a few, like the book of Hebrews and the book of Jude. Uh, these may have uncertain origins. Some say the book of Hebrew was written by Paul. Some say it was written by Jude. Some think it was Apollos that uh, wrote the book um, of, uh, of Hebrews. Uh, but they were widely accepted and their material is perfectly tuned to the other New Testament writings. There are no, you, know, you read the book of Hebrews, if you remember Hebrews, there's no theological errors there. It supports and elaborates the doctrine of, uh, uh, of the uh, redemption and vicarious atonement of Christ and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's accurate, all right? Uh, let's talk about translations here because I usually get questions about translations. The Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language, most of it anyways, there are some small uh, parts of the Old Testament written in Aramaic. Uh, there came a time when the Jews could not speak Hebrew. They were losing their culture, they were losing their language because of the Greek influence. Okay? And those of you, you know, I'm looking around at a few, you know, uh, my children, I spoke French at home when I grew up. I was growing up, you know, I spoke French to my mom, Lisa and I, we speak French to each other at home. And our children, while we were in Canada, were learning how to speak French, because you know, they had French kids. But once we moved to the United States, you know, the French, we kept our French, you know, Lisa and I, obviously, you know, we grew up with the language, but our kids didn't speak French anymore. Who, who's, who speaks French in Oklahoma? You know, maybe Spanish, but not, not French. And so the sad thing is that our grandchildren now, you know, that language, that cultural thing that Lisa and I, that cultural language, that's lost by, that, by that, the grandchildren's generation. Oh, they learn words and things like that, but you know that uh, you know, Lily or, 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 or uh, you know, uh, Savannah or anyone. I only have 10, so you know, it's all right. I, again, you know, you know, none of them are going to be speaking to me in French. So it's a bit of a sad thing, you know, because that's part of my culture. You know, my mother spoke only French, you know, and so on and so forth. So the same type of thing with
happening in Israel. Because of the Greek influence and Greek literature and so on and so forth, the Jews were not speaking Hebrew anymore, but the scriptures were written in Hebrew. And so what they did is they made a translation of the, what we call the Old Testament into the Greek language. And the name of that translation is the Septuagint. So you hear sometimes that term, the Septuagint. Septuagint, that term, 770, because 70 scholars worked on the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into, into Greek. So there was the first type of translation that we're talking about. Uh, during the Old Testament, uh, New Testament time, the people uh, spoke Aramaic, which was uh, the ancient language of Palestine. The books and the letters of the New Testament, however, were not written in this language. The books of the New Testament were written in the common form of Greek at the time, what's called Koine Greek, and it was the universal language of the period. So the Greek form remained the standard as copies were made from the original and distributed for the first couple of centuries. There are in existence today 5,357 Greek manuscripts of portions of the New Testament that scholars work with. And what's interesting is that there are more, uh, more um, original transcripts and copies of the New Testament than there are of Shakespeare's um, Shakespeare's material, and, and yet no one doubts Shakespeare. Oh, of course Shakespeare. You know. But there are way more documents that exist today uh, attesting to the writings of the New Testament that scholars from all over the world uh, use, and they're in various museums, uh, many of them of course in, in England actually, and some in Egypt, and some, some here even in the United States. So with time, the Greek was translated into Latin and then into other languages, but these translations were always made from the original Greek manuscripts. And there's a mistake that people make and an argument, a false argument, it's called the telephone argument. They say, you know, if this guy talks to this guy and he tells them you know, a story and then this guy talks to this guy you know, and tells him the story and then this guy talks to this guy and tells him the same story, by the time you get to this guy over here, you know, 20 guys removed, I mean, it's like a different story. You don't even recognize it. And they say, that's why you can't trust the translations of the Bible, but that's incorrect. When the Bible is translated, you begin with the original manuscripts, okay, the copies of the original manuscripts. All right? So the scholars are working from the Greek into Latin, for example. Okay? Well, they don't go from Latin to English, and then from English to German, and then from German to French. They go from, Latin, from Greek to Latin. Oh, you want a French version? From Greek to French. Oh, you want an English version? From Greek to English, from Greek to German, from Greek to French, from Greek to Chinese, all, every translation always begins with the very same documents. Okay? I remember when Lisa and I were first converted, that was one of our fears, that we were reading something that wasn't accurate because of translations, because growing up, as we grew up in Catholic Quebec, there was a, 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 a lot of reticence in studying the Bible. When I grew up, it was like, oh, if you study the Bible, you'll go crazy, you can never understand it. All these things, oh, the translations are all mixed up, it's not accurate. So we had our method of testing. Since both of us, thankfully, we're bilingual, French and English, she would have a French Bible, I would have an English Bible. She would read her Bible in French, and don't forget, I could speak English and French, so I'd listen to the French and think with my English brain, you know, what does that mean? And then I would read the same passage in English from another Bible and she would examine it. And that's how we would study at the beginning. And we, we realized, oh, they're saying exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing, word per word, except this is the French version of that and this is the English version of that. So try to remember that the translations all come from the same from the same source, okay? Um, Latin was the language of the western portion of the Roman Empire, 
And so as Christianity spread westward from its original home, where Greek was the dominant language, a new version of the, um, of the Bible was developed. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Greek Orthodox Church still uses the Septuagint version of the Old Testament and the Greek version of the New. Um, in 404 AD, remember I said 367, you know, the, the canon is finally confirmed. Not much later, 404 AD, uh, a new Latin version of the Bible was produced by a man called Jerome, who was an early church leader. His translation from the Greek to Latin was called the Latin Vulgate. Okay, when we say vulgar, today when we say vulgar, we mean, oh, that's ugly, this, you know. But the original source of that word mean, meant ordinary, common. So it was the Latin Vulgate. It was the translation into the, uh, uh, the uh, common language of the time. Okay? Um, this because the standard version for study, uh, this became rather the standard version for study and church, the Latin Vulgate, Jerome's Latin Vulgate. This is what the church uh, used for many, many centuries. Various translations were made into common languages of the time, just like the common language of Latin. Other translations uh, in the fifth century, all, all the way through to the 14th century, were produced. Uh, Gothic, Syrian, Slavic, English, French, German, Italian, Spanish, as I say, all from the original Greek into the common languages of the people. Now in the 14th century, there was a renewed interest in the Greco-Roman world and its languages and literature, and this was brought on by the Renaissance. The Renaissance painters and writers and so on and so forth sparked this interest in what at that time were the ancient languages, Hebrew, Greek, the Bible, so on and so forth. This new trend led to a revival of the study of the original Greek and Hebrew languages, as well as a study of the ancient Bible manuscripts. This zeal to produce new Bible versions in common languages translated directly from the original Greek and Hebrew was helped along by a new religious movement called the Reformation. So we see how historical things work together, if you wish, to produce more and more versions of the Bible. Then, as it would so happen, with the invention of Gutenberg's printing press in 1436, the technology to actually produce mass quantities of Bibles in different languages was finally realized. They had the dream, they said, wow, you know, Imagine if we could translate the Bible into all these common languages and bring God's word to all these people so they didn't need a scholar or a priest okay, or an official, official clergyman to read the Bible to them. They could read it from themselves. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Whoa, Gutenberg comes along, invents the printing press, which makes the technology makes the dream come true. It's a little bit like I tell you about the internet. You know, the technology of the internet has made the dream of preaching to the whole world every single day come true. Well, the same thing happened when Gutenberg invented the press. Now, it's interesting to note that the very first book to be printed on his press was the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible, sometime between 1452 and 1455. This Bible was called, interestingly enough, the 42-line Bible, because there were exactly 42 lines on each page. Okay? And that original Bible still exists today and can be seen at the uh, Gutenberg Museum in Mainz, uh, which is near Frankfurt, Germany, and also there was a display of ancient books and Bibles that came to Oklahoma. Was it the Green family, I think, who they own Hobby Lobby? Anyways, they have a, a quite an extensive collection of rare books, and one of, not the original one, but one of the Gutenberg Bibles was here in Oklahoma, and we went to the museum to see it. It was just fascinating, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Anyways, the invention of the printing press helped spread the Bible in various languages throughout the world. The earliest known English translation, so that's of our interest, 700 AD. It was a Latin version with English notes between the lines. That was the original one. 
The first complete English translation was done by John Wycliffe, 1382, and of course he was imprisoned for his efforts. You know, no good deed left unpunished there. The very first printed English Bible was by William Tyndale in 1526. There were many translations as the science of translation and archaeology developed. Um, a major translation, of course, was the King James Bible, 1611, and it became the authorized version for English-speaking people for many, many years and is still a very, very popular edition of the Bible. Many other translations have appeared over the years. Uh, the, the, the Revised Standard Version, the American Standard, the New American Standard, the New International Version, the New Living Translation, and each of these Bibles, they have a different style. For example, the Revised Standard Version, great Old Testament translation, but the New Testament's a little awkward when you read it. You know, it's a little, the sentences are a little awkward. The American Standard Version, it is probably the best word-per-word -word translation of any uh, of the translations, but the English is complicated. Just like if you speak two languages, try translating something word-per-word -word into another language. It comes out, you, know, you, you have to use some type of paraphrase, okay? That's the problem with the ASV. New American Standard Version was an effort to correct that to take the best of the American standard and kind of refine it so the English flowed just a little more smoothly. And then you have the new international uh, version, um, a great uh, reading Bible. For some people it's a little too general. A new living translation is what's called a paraphrase. In, instead of translating word per word, they're trying to translate the idea. Okay? That's what you call a paraphrase. Some say you, know, you can't trust uh, any translation because translators can make mistakes from the Greek. Of the thousands of translation in different languages, there are no major doctrines, persons, commands that are in conflict or question. When I study with someone, I ask them, do you have a Bible? And they say, oh yeah, let's use your Bible. You know, I, I became a Christian reading the King James Version. You know, now I use the New American Standard. For, you know, I, show me your Bible, I will show you from the Bible that Jesus is the Son of God, that you need to repent and be baptized, that you, you know, I mean, all the teachings, give me any Bible, I'll show you. I'll teach you the same doctrines, okay? If there are mistakes, they're usually punctuation errors or perhaps the names of places or locations which are obscure anyways in the original languages. Modern scholarship says that the percentage of error in today's translation from the Greek text is less than one-tenth of one percent. So in other words, don't worry about not understanding the Hebrew or the Greek. When you are reading the English or French or whatever version you are reading, you are reading 99 and nine-tenths percent of what was written in the Greek or the Hebrew. You can trust the Bible because it will accurately tell you what God is wanting to say to you in your own language. So, very quickly here before we run out of time, we've reviewed how they decided which books belonged in the New Testament canon, what events motivated them to do this, what criteria they used to select the material. We've looked at the division of the New Testament and some information on how they were translated into modern languages. All right. Next lesson, next time, we're going to look at the content of the Bible and answer the question, why do I believe that the Bible is inspired? Why do I believe that? And we'll kind of put, put forth some arguments. Remember, we're looking at the seven major doctrines that explain Christianity. The first major doctrine that we're talking about is the inspiration of the Bible. That's why I've given you so much background about its writing and how it's put together and so on and so forth. Next week, we'll really bear down and give the reasons why we believe that the Bible is inspired. Okay, that's good, that's enough for this time.